Um, so welcome to the first of our uh, thoughts, leadership talks on the Next Generation Converged Digital Infrastructure Project, which is joint between, jointly funded between BT and the EPSRC. It's aimed at keeping the UK ahead as a leading, leading digital economy. So just giving the infrastructure the flexibility to deliver new and unthought of services quickly uh, and providing the basis for uh, creativity and market experimentation. And also giving the infrastructure the intelligence to manage itself through self-learning autonomic uh, technologies um, and to deliver more powerful controls and information to the human world that surrounds it, um, aiming at better service levels and economics. So it covers four universities and you'll hear from each of them um, in the series of talks. Uh, all have already had very long standing and successful collaborations with uh, BT. <clears throat> And talking of long-standing uh, successful collaborations, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Nick Race of in Lancaster, who's the academic uh, principal investigator, uh, who tells me that way back, uh, he actually did his PhD project uh, at BT Labs. So he knows BT inside out. It's great to have you, Nick. Um, Nick's going to give us a tour of the architecture um, and introduce the project and, and therefore through that, uh, also provide uh, insights into the talks that will follow and um, some tasters for what you'll hear in the series. So we'll hope you'll uh, book into the series again to hear all, all the details. But thanks very much and over to Nick. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thanks for the introduction. So, um, so yes, my 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 history with BT dates back to the to the mid nineties. So that's that's already giving away my age, perhaps. But um, but yes, um, doing a PhD um, supported by BT in the mid nineties, and, and at the time working on the uh, the futures test bed, as it was named back then, and and technologies such as IPv6. So it's it's fantastic to be to be back um, leading this initiative called NGCDI and having the opportunity to talk to. to folks right across the organization about the project. So um, so without further ado, I'll start with some background to the, the project and, and really what the headlines of that, that project was looking to achieve. NGCDI was really set up a number of years ago in the context of a very changing world, a world in which we're seeing the future around driverless vehicles, the growth in Internet of Things or IoT devices, particularly in the home. Uh, then we've got the continuing demands on improvements in video quality, moving from standard definition to high definition to ultra HD and onwards to 8K video. Uh, and in spite of improvements in encoding efficiencies, we still see step changes in the demand on the underlying network associated with those uh, upward movements in quality. We've also seen technologies such as VR and augmented reality coming to the fore and really exciting new applications of these technologies being considered in both the work and home environments. So all of these conscious that these are on the horizon or already with us, um, but also with the question of well, what's next? And, and actually that unknown quantity that obviously the infrastructure has to support. So, so with that, with that perspective and that concern around how do we make sure that we can deliver uh, the future internet, the future infrastructure to support that, uh, these are all ch challenges that uh, BT and, and companies like BT are facing. So what I wanted to do was, was talk about um, how a bunch of technologies that, that really arised at the time, um, it was really in the kind of 2007 or 2016, 2018 to time frame that we started to develop um, a range of ideas around the growth in microservices, data-driven decision-making, the use of virtual network functions, all of these technologies, network slicing, autonomics and 5G, all really showing significant prominence um, within the context of the project and the potential for really capitalizing on the use of these technologies to help make a better infrastructure, a converged digital infrastructure. So NGCDI was introduced as a project in the 2017 timeframe with the intention of using and capitalizing on the fact that we've got more 
focus on microservices. We've seen this move to virtualized network functions. We've got additional flexibility coming from the infrastructure and we're able to make better decisions driven by data to help aid and guide how those infrastructures are then managed. And coupled with 5G network slicing and the move to autonomics, this was all uh, the, the promise of how we can use those exciting new technologies um, together. So that very much kind of sets the kind of original outline for how the project was conceived and what its objectives were. So just to recap um, what Steve was talking about, it's a 5 million EPSRC Prosperity Partnership. And this was a, a new scheme that EPSRC launched and we were the first uh, wave um, of funded projects as part of that scheme, looking at how we can bridge academia and industry much closer together and work collaboratively on key strategic projects. So the Prosperity Partnership was was funded for over a five year period. So we're just in the kind of the mid midway point at that uh, at this pro process. Um, the funding is, uh, as Stephen already said, was split between BT and EPSRC, and it had at that high level objective, and we'll be packing unpacking a lot of this objective in the in the slides to come, was around using the data driven methods and technologies for a resilient autonomic digital infrastructure of the future. I think it's important to, to stress that this is a, a multidisciplinary research program. We've got four universities all bringing different backgrounds and different skill sets into that consortium. So um, from Lancaster, we have uh, groups as part of the School of Computing and Communications um, that are bringing uh, backgrounds in networking. And we have the Department of Mathematics and Statistics um, bringing their perspective, particularly in the statistical area. We have Cambridge um, focused on two key areas around industrial automation from their Institute for Manufacturing Group and organizational behavior. And I'll talk more about organizational behavior uh, in a bit, but that's also led out of the Judge Business School at Cambridge as well. So um, again, two different groups within Cambridge all contributing to the project. We've also got expertise from Surrey and predominantly around their 5G Innovation Center around networks. And at Bristol, we've got um, expertise in the electrical and electronic engineering and focusing on wireless and communication systems. So we've got quite a, a range of disciplines there, disciplines covered there, all with that aspiration of, of deriving the next generation uh, infrastructure and that, that a converged infrastructure. So what we're looking here is to, to really to, to establish an infrastructure, which as far as we can achieve is reconfigurable rapidly. So we don't have to be adding or replacing kit to enable services that we, we didn't anticipate. Um, and we can do this by now orchestrating software. So we should be able to deliver services far more optimally for the delivery network, whether that's mobile or fixed networks. And we can capitalize on technologies such as 5G and really look at delivering these new capabilities such as uh, kind of low latency and, and the need for more real-time services. So how can we do this? Well, the intention in, in the projects is to focus on that agility in the infrastructure. So the fact that we can now build on network functions based around micro NFE capabilities, and we can build those in a way that we can adapt them to the needs of those future services. We're looking at a framework through which we can better understand the network, what's happening within the network by underpinning the network with agents that can diagnose state and then report that state to a knowledge framework that can help to detect and diagnose potential disruptions in service and take autonomous actions. And I think that that's key here. We're looking at how we can make the infrastructure take autonomous decisions where appropriate. But of course, we have to be mindful of the fact that we have to have the successful integration of, of that technology within the business and within all the business functions. And we have to have people trusting that technology. And so there's key questions here about when do we invoke uh, asking questions of humans to make decisions and when do we actually let the autonomous actions uh, from the infrastructure take place, or when do we need to refer to humans to, to, to support that process? And so all of those aspects of the integration with the business functions is a key part of that process as well. So what we're using here is a combination of, of the, the capabilities that we're seeing emerging with NFE and distributed autonomy, um, but looking at how we can get the infrastructure to really look after and optimize itself. 
And how do we ensure we connect that infrastructure to, if you like, the fundamental business processes? And, and can we rethink some of those business processes or can we improve those business, business in processes if the technology can be exploited to the full? And of course, what this also opens up the possibility is actually we need potentially some new skills and cultures as a result of this, this integration as well there. So those are kind of really interesting aspects to the, t the, the project, which is why we have a very much a kind of multidisciplinary uh, perspective on this, this endeavor. So what we're looking to build with NGCDI is an architecture which can deal with uh, complexity and scale and deal with that in an economic way. So that might be providing frictionless scaling of capacity, enabling the business to manage, um, say, things like complexity in new ways, uh, potentially through things like policies and intent so that we'll discover, um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about shortly. Um, how do we manage multi-party requirements and particularly around working with network operators, service providers, uh, industry verticals, individuals, where there's potentially uh, the negotiation of those requirements and some formulation of those requirements to enable autonomic an automatic deployment operation. And this is kind of very much around some of the work that I'll be talking around intent-based networking. Um, how do we provide greater agility? So. Can we have the capability to assess viability of, say, new products and services? Um, can we model those services? Can we trial them in a way that gives us confidence about the delivery of those services? Um, and can we provide the capability to capture perhaps emergent processes and inventory changes so that we can free the architecture from what has been the kind of classic, cumbersome, historic processes that we have there? Um, how do we ensure uh, a greater focus on customer service or, or rather enabling the, the, the customer um, and support for the customer to be based on decisions with a greater knowledge of the overall business and the, the balances and trade-offs that may play there. So that's all about how we can use data that we drive from models of the infrastructure and operations and how can we provide means to distinguish perhaps problematic conditions from, from normal operations in some form of re in, in, in real time. So that if we're making interventions, they're very much focused on the customer uh, and the effects on the customer rather than potentially just purely localized uh, measures or technical measures there. Um, and how can we ensure that we provide recommended interventions that based on kind of capturing knowledge from all of the operations that are happening here? Um, we naturally need to connect with existing and new processes. So that involves information, um, people, and culture. So how do we identify with the data we actually need from the infrastructure that's going to trigger existing engineering processes or driving perhaps new simplified processes as appropriate? How can we identify the information and controls that are offered by the infrastructure that will actually engender trust from the operation and business personnel. Um, that, that's absolutely crucial. And how can we identify where we may need, say, new governance processes or existing governance processes and structures for ensuring business safe operations at scale and perhaps learning from um, other risk conscious sectors? Um, these, these are all kind of huge challenges. Um, and then finally, providing mechanisms to understand and flex manage risks. So this is basically to support that broader view of decision making by exploiting an understanding and modeling of the balances, the business balances between cost, services, the ability to respond, robustness and resilience, and, and really a deployment of these kind of policy changes into the infrastructure. So it, it's all about this ambition to enable the business to optimize the investment timescales that it's making and balancing that infrastructure robustness with predictive or predictive and reactive maintenance regimes informed through a self-learning infrastructure. And that's what we're, we're looking to achieve here. So we need uh, an infrastructure that as far as is possible, is able to reconfigure rapidly so we don't have to add or replace kit to enable services, as I said, that we didn't anticipate it. And we can do this through thinking about uh, augmenting software, orchestrating software, and enable us to do this in an efficient way. So abstracting knowledge and controls of business functions, and I'll talk more about the intent. How can we distribute that, that knowledge that we need and how we, can we balance that relationship between humans? How do we orchestrate those services and how do we achieve that at scale? How can we 
ensure that we have um, a balance of risks, conscious of service cost and timescales? And how do we mitigate risk by understanding and detecting anomalies, um, which will give us proactive behaviours that, that we can mitigate any potential risk concerns? And then how do we ensure that we prepare this for a transformation within the organisation itself? So these are all, if you like, capabilities that we're looking to ensure are realised through the NGCDI project. So thinking about this in uh, more architectural terms, um, here's a very simplified view, if you like, of the main features of our architecture that we're looking to, 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 to create here. So we've got ways of stimulating and building in new requirements, um, deploying into and monitoring and controlling the infrastructure through a knowledge layer. And then we have the, the converged infrastructure underpinning all of that. So let's think about, we will have multiple um, requirements that will need to be taken into account from providers, content providers, service providers, infrastructure operators. And there may be a tension in terms of some of those costs and, uh, and service levels that, uh, that are involved there. So we may have a set of different uh, service functions that are non-functional, uh, functional or cost risk balances that we need to take into account. And we need ways in which we can model and formalize those through interaction and modeling with the knowledge layer, knowledge and control layer, based on data from the infrastructure and patterns that we observed previously. We then there were to deploy changes into that converged infrastructure and that potentially satisfied demand. But we then may have new demands that come in in real time. Um, we may also have environmental changes such as the weather or faults that have an impact on the operation of that infrastructure. So we need to be able to keep that knowledge control layer updated. And then that in its turn will trigger new processes and, and activities to take place. So this may involve uh, a combination of human activities and machine activities. It may be field work, it may be desk work, but these are all aspects that then return back to the business to trigger and an alert appropriate people um, at the right time and um, as the urgency and levels increase. And then finally, kind of the, the first uh, the first decision of a control system and algorithm that we're looking at is to discriminate and decide which actions it can actually take automatically and which will need human intervention, human um, consultation. And that's absolutely critical there. And then, but there also needs to be checks that the whole system is continuing to deliver business value. And that's that kind of a key mix of internal triggers that we're getting from the system and the external monitoring, say the market environment that are coming into play here. So this may ultimately trigger a process to revisit the requirements or intents of the development process itself. And in fact, we may need a very different product or a reshaping um, to deliver that. So these are kind of all new interesting questions that, we're, that arise as a result of these, these architectural changes. So if we think about NGCDI and the full life cycle of the project, we've, we've, we've got this um, architectural view here that I'm just going to go through to give you a, a real uh, sense of the jigsaw of components that comprise the architecture. And that will hopefully set the scene for the work that um, you'll you'll hear more about in the course of this uh, these this session today and in the future sessions to come. So, let's just start on the the first aspect, which is around the intent, and this is a kind of area that's become really quite a a, a key topic within the project, which is how we how we deal with the fact that requirements are going to be changing and evolving at an ever increasing pace. So we need smart ways for negotiating those requirements and, and dealing with multiple parties and delivering those requirements into the infrastructure. So um, this may involve having simulations being carried out before deployment, but we need to be able to ensure not just, not only of the service functionally, but also service levels and what they may mean for costs and, and say, uh, capacity of the investment. So we need a way to express 
that at a business level. And then iterating those requirements through simulations may result in a more machine readable version of intent with some more formalized requirements that can be used automatically to orchestrate software based network and service functions that then we deploy into the infrastructure to deliver the service. And, and the intention here is that this capability or this capacity can be scaled up or down without needing to install dedicated equipment. And um, we have um, a talk coming up in November from uh, Ning and Harris. We will talk about the research in this area. And I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this as well around some of the work that we're doing on intent um, very shortly. And then the second part of this is around the agreed service levels will need to be managed in a dynamic way. So in the real world, we're going to see disturbances. We're going to see surges in traffic demand, equipment failures, data errors, engineering works. And some of these events will be manageable automatically by self-learning software agent based control. So which in real time can find potentially the next available new balance between these requirements, such as maintaining certain service levels subject to potential cost constraints. And so um, we'll also have a, a talk here around the work that's been developed to produce a prototype of uh, an agent based knowledge layer that can capitalize on the intents that we provide from a business layer. And that's been some joint work between Lancaster and Cambridge. So how does that self-learning process actually take place? And the algorithms we're looking to develop here, the control algorithms we're developing will obviously use network events. That may be traffic-based telemetry, et cetera, to learn about potential problem states. And we can use statistical information about life cycle usage, for instance, that can then use agents to help optimize the infrastructure based on service level intents. What's important here for this level of autonomous control is that we really have to balance this new category of associated risks and costs. And we need an approach that considers the accuracy of a decision that's required and how fast the learning process needs to be and the speed of a response. And, and all of these are really interconnected questions. So this may need us to look at new ways of judging or making decisions based on the extent to which, say, things like prognostic maintenance can be used to preempt service issues based on the likely scale of outage. And some of the work we, that we're doing here is creating models to support the decision making processes that businesses in the industry will clearly need. Ajis from Cambridge will be talking more about the technologies for supporting an intelligent infrastructure in his talk in December. And Philip Stiles, also from Cambridge, will be talking about how we can build this cultural awareness and, and risk fluency that we really need to ensure these technologies can be successfully integrated within organizations. To have this autonomic capability, we need to think about how that's going to be distributed. So, for instance, many aspects of a 5G network will be self-optimizing. And so some of the work that, um, that Rob from Bristol will be talking about um, in March is the need to be able to do modeling and novel modeling methods, be able to respond to changing patterns. So this is recognizing that just simple centralized control is not going to scale. So to support key business functions, we're going to need a sufficient representation of the knowledge. And, and this could be a, a, a mix of types. So we may need pre-stored scenarios that we build from modeling, or we need machine learning, which we can enact when appropriate. And some of this may be selected or aggregated data at lower resolutions. Um, we can use that in real time uh, with monitoring. And then we can control, but tune to the right response rate and accuracy. Um, so these are all sophisticated um, new modeling techniques that are necessary to look at uh, the data that's being captured in real time. But we also need new statistical techniques themselves to enable us to detect changes and anomalies in massive real time data flows and, and distinguishing them from, from normal stats. Um, and that's going to be described by Idris Eckley from Lancaster and his talk coming up in January. And that's particularly looking at how, how we can detect those anomalies in, in huge real time data flows. And then finally, uh, thinking at the business level. So um, 
whilst towards the left of the picture, we're developing an architecture to automate as much as possible the flow right from the requirements to, to deployment. Um, to the right and the upper parts of this diagram, we're looking at building greater capacity and capability for managing service infrastructures and how we can augment human decision making at a business level. How can we improve customer response, responsivity and service levels? So I'm now going to do um, a, a brief canter through some of those because I've spent some time discussing, if you like, this from an architectural perspective. So I want to give you a sense of some real instances within the project where we're looking at these and, and so focused on a number of these threads built from this, this original architecture. So I'm going to start by um, intent-based um, work that we're doing on intent-based networking. And this is all, as I said, reflecting on the fact that the rate of delivery and new services is going to depend on smarter ways to capture customer needs and translating them into service definition and delivery. And so what we're looking at in this work is investigating how we can capture both business and customer intents in uh, in some ways that can be transfer, translated into machine readable uh, and machine readable form. And that covers not just the, the notion of service creation, but also DevOps and methods to maintain or renego need, renegotiate service levels in real time in the face of changing demands. So one of the technologies that has been coming to the fore within um, in the project and particularly within the kind of networking research domain is the notion of intent based networking. And this, as the name probably suggests, is all about how we express um, an intent rather than what we're probably quite used to doing traditionally, which is telling a network how to do something. So we're, we're very good um, at being very prescriptive, but actually um, what we're looking at in this work is how can we get the network to instead um, being very prescriptive, express what we want to do in the form of what we want to achieve in the form of an intent and have the network through the automation capabilities and orchestration capabilities transform the network in its own way. So transfer the network, how the network should do it. So this is the focus instead of um, expressing in a prescriptive way, we can look at the notion of intent. And I'll give you some kind of more, more concrete examples to, to describe what that might involve. So we've got a few use cases that we're focused on within the project. Um, some of these may be familiar to you, but we're looking at scenarios where, for instance, we need to update router software or automatically. And so how can we express in an intent this requirement to say um, migrate traffic away, which traditionally may have been carried out in some sort of manual approach. So if we were wanting to upgrade to switches, we'd look to introduce a manual traffic migration away from those switches. Uh, we'd look to upgrade those sw switch software separately, and then we'd manually re-rate the traffic back. So how can we get the network through the expression of an intent to migrate the traffic automatically um, away from those switches, update the switches with tested configurations in the DevOps world that we're, we're now very familiar with and that automatically route that traffic back. And that's one scenario we're, we're thinking about with the interplay between networking, uh, DevOps and intent. So how can we package that, uh, that desire into those, those three key areas? I'll give you, um, so, so this would be around how, how we can uh, reroute traffic automatically to allow us that, that oper operation to upgrade. One of the other aspects we're looking at is the, the predictive maintenance. So how, how can we, if, if we can detect hardware failure or predict hardware failure by really understanding the data that we're able to collect and having models around the data that we're collecting there, can we predict hardware failure and migrate data automatically that would allow those components suitable for replacement. So again, this is looking at how we can express that in a way that the network itself can deliver that capability. So um, if we're identified that there's a potential faulty switch, how can the, the infrastructure, and this is kind of an interesting interplay between where, where does the human Involved, involved in that process? Um, is, is somebody notified that that needs to happen? Um, is that automatically then the network that carries out that function? But these are kind of use cases that we're looking to try drive behaviors. 
And then finally, another use case that we're looking at is um, looking at virtual CDNs and enabling the infrastructure itself to uh, scale up and scale down as appropriate. So, for instance, um, could we have a uh, CDN provider, for example, or a content producer looking where the, the infrastructure can automatically scale up the operation in a particular area of the network. So this would enable um, the, the infrastructure to handle those requests in an automatic manner based on the fact that we've now got additional virtualization capabilities that, that can come into play there. And we can deploy those far more efficiently in, a, in an agile way, way in the locations that are, are important. So that's around um, intent and, and work that we're doing there. Um, of course, adding intelligence to the network and, and, and network assets really offers us a possibility that the infrastructure can trigger a whole set of different maintenance processes. And as I touched on before, prognostics and prognostic maintenance scheduling will enable us to really concentrate engineering effort on reducing the risk to customer service and cost. And so what we're looking at here is whereby assets can learn from their own experience um, or potentially from swarms of other assets that can anticipate their remaining useful life and then cooperatively decide that actually the best means to maintain service uh, is for them is to for them to reconfigure themselves or or call out for human help so these are all sorts of um, modeling that we're looking to do with risk models really looking to um, anticipate the likely propagation of problems across the network um, and particularly for things like network power and um, and what really is the best um, really we're looking to determine the best course of action at the time based on the whole dynamics of the situation such as network uh, traffic patterns so so what we're doing with this this work and this is um, very much kind of led from from Cambridge is around the firstly the generation analysis of of assets and the data that's performance data that's attached to those assets themselves. Then looking at what what is happening to those assets and this is where um, and I'll talk a bit more about anomaly detection um, comes into play. So how can we use that uh, knowledge of um, changes in that feed to then take potentially proactive behavior and predict where we may see a trend that would suggest that there will be a potential major service outage. And then how can we decide what interventions to make and when? Um, so that may need to be some equipment that's replaced at an appropriate time within a particular time frame. And we can start to look at how that invokes uh, the reconfiguration of service uh, provisions and repair schedules based on that advanced knowledge of an impending failure. And so that potentially some autonomous behavior can happen, but also manual intervention may be required where equipment needs to be replaced. And then looping all of that learning from all of those processes back through from the original generation of, of data and learning and then redesigning what we do and when we need to intervene at those appropriate mechanisms or those appropriate points. So one of the pieces that has been looked at um, around uh, in Cambridge is, is really how can we improve predictive maintenance by monitoring um, by monitoring devices, which would traditionally be um, applying simple thresholds there and um, potentially doesn't give us the capability to look at um, predictive capabilities there. So these are key research issues that have been investigated at Cambridge in a number of different contexts from having uh, risk models attached to certain devices and certain trend patterns, um, and then understanding what the customer impact and the customer perception of that impact would be. So this would be around equipping agents um, and, and devices within the infrastructure that would allow us to focus on risk, cost and performance metrics. It will be looking at what network optimal actions might be determined uh, by grouping, say, maintenance activities and, and value-based prioritization. And this is all enabled by having equipment agents communicating in, in real time to a, a set of agents higher up in a hierarchy. And so what we're, what we're looking at now is developing the management and control layer that's really going to support the integration of that agent information that's coming in with some of the decision making processes. So we have this knowledge and management layer that enables that agent control. So we're able to 
provide some element of autonomy within the infrastructure, but we, at the same time, we can coordinate those resources uh, potentially in, in an autonomic way, but also then reach out to um, managers and um, potential repairers that need to come in and address some of the real um, deployment concerns where, 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 where that's required. So this is, if you feel like, um, the overarching view of where we have some element of supervisory control and where we have non-supervisory control and the elements that can happen in an autonomous way linked to an understanding of the infrastructure and where we may need to reach out to the service view to then, say, make changes to service schedules, et cetera. So one of the ways we've been realizing this um, is to develop a prototype and in particular an agent based supervisory control prototype, which is there to highlight how we can monitor various different aspects of the infrastructure. So that's maybe the performance and condition of the infrastructure and trigger actions. Uh, beyond standard network control. We can capitalize on having deeper integration with software-defined networks and controllers um, of SDN networks that allows us to get data around traffic and flows and potentially service protection periods. And we can integrate then data-driven prognostic models to predict the condition of network elements and then trigger those maintenance planning processes that I mentioned. And where we, where we may need to, we can look at rerouting traffic that doesn't just consider the data and measurement from the SDN, but also the physical condition of devices. And so what, what's been developed, and again, this will be something um, that colleagues will talk more about, is a prototype that builds on the agent-based traffic engineering aspects that we talked about in tandem with the control elements. So this is, a, this is a nice example that really starts to integrate all of those aspects that are talked about right from the off in terms of the, the different elements of the project, combining intents, combining control algorithms, combining the ability to detect uh, potential changes and anomalies, and building that in the form of a prototype that enables us to carry out um, some service views on our infrastructure that are aligned to the use cases that I mentioned. So the instance whereby we're able to automatically reroute traffic based on uh, potential equipment failures or proactively um, deal with issues around impending service failures and rerouting accordingly. So colleagues will talk more about the specifics of that prototype in, uh, in the slides and the presentations to come. Um, I just wanted to touch on work that's going on at Bristol around simulations and particularly around what, what if models. And this is very much focused on uh, an environment that they're looking at around the notion of vehicles and thinking about an environment where we have autonomous vehicles and being able to model the behavior of those autonomous vehicles in the context of the available signal coverage for those areas. So for instance, we have the ability to have uh, digital twins that then we can control through our own kind of digital controls what we can tweak. And that's coupled with an AI module that are now labels us to really look at solving tasks in a digital world that predicts how behaviors would be an environment where we have, say, autonomous vehicles uh, and a 5G coverage area. And we can start to understand the different coverage behaviors and where we may need to change, say, uh, coverage and coverage um, power to address the requirements of the infrastructure beneath that. So this gives us a chance to now try out a number of scenarios. So for instance, so just, just to highlight one of the, the pieces of work they're doing here, which is around Drive, which is a digital twin for self-driving intelligent vehicles. And they've been developing a framework that's really tackling the shortcomings of traditional vehicle and network simulators and providing a flexible uh, modular and scalable implementation that we can actually do kind of very large scale citywide experimentation um, with, with pretty moderate computational costs there. So, so this is really about creating a digital twin that's a unique architecture that allows for sequential queries um, to which then this digital twin can provide a kind of instantaneous response. 
with that kind of state of the world and and uh, and, and the term that they use to refer to this is the notion of an oracle here so this enables um a, if you like a bi-directional interaction between intelligent agents realistic mobility traces and really provides us with an environment to, to develop train and optimize machine learning based approaches so this provides a nice complement to look at future scenarios particularly in the context of of wireless systems and enables us to try out those what if scenarios that potentially then impact how the infrastructure is actually rolled out. Um, so this is this is a, a kind of important activity that we, we're also uh, deploying in uh, in Bristol. And um, Rob will be talking more about this uh, in an upcoming talk as well. And then um, in terms of the kind of final areas, I've talked uh, a bit about the fact that we need to detect change and we need to understand when anomalies take place. And if you like, we've got many examples across BT of really interesting challenges around learning what's the normal operation of a network and when is there some anomalous behavior that's actually taking place and that might be failure it might say hardware failure it may be degrading performance or it may be due to misconfiguration and so on the slide here we've got trevor's comment around continuously in real time learning about the normal operation of a network and then automatically alerting if there's some anomalous behavior we've got Peter's comment around detecting the emergence of anomalous behavior. Um, and, and the key here is really trying to detect that anomalous behavior very, very early on. So say if uh, the pattern for a particular day is starting to look a little bit different. And then finally, we've got Arjun's comment around detecting anomalous behavior across mobile cells. And um, that may be to potentially identify deteriorating hardware before it actually breaks and then taking some action. Um, and so that comes back to the point uh, in, in the talk earlier around the need to manage infrastructure proactively and then take appropriate action. And so that might be in this case, actually then load balancing across multiple cells that would allow the maintenance schedules to to resolve the particular issues with hardware. So, so these represent a lot of the, the kind of interesting challenges here. So how can we go about actually detecting these anomalies? Well, one of the ways we can do this is to use something called change points, which represents work, uh, ongoing work at Lancaster. Um, for those of a more mathematical disposition, there's a, a mathematical definition of change points on the slide here. Um, for those less mathematically inclined, which includes myself, I find it easier to look at some examples of change and the different types of change. And uh, at the bottom of the slide here, you can see we've got a, a few examples. We've got an example that shows changes in mean. Uh, we've got one that shows changes in variability. And then we've got one that simply shows changes in slope. And, and actually there from a human perspective, some of these or the ability to detect these changes is, is actually quite straightforward. So these, these changes may look quite obvious and um, where it starts to get more challenging is in some of these ex other examples where we've got less less trivial changes. Um, so these examples represent, say, change in uh, time dependent structures of a signal and, and humans are generally pretty good at detecting these changes. But um, where this can become really quite time consuming is when you're considering observing uh, data from sensors and potentially at very high frequency. So imagine this is every 15 minutes from 1800 base stations, all with lots of metrics and counters. And then this actually be, starts to become a huge kind of data challenge and so the key here is to learn about what's the baseline behavior and then the likely deviations around it and then raising an alarm if anomaly is indeed found so where the emphasis on change points within the project has been is, is around looking for changes in operational performance. And that's looking at data streams on the basis that we don't tend to know a lot in advance about what types of changes to expect or which interventions uh, to make a response. And a lot of the community, in particular the statistics community, have been focused on identifying complicated or subtle changes that occur in new settings. And so the work that's been carried out here within NGCDI is focused on uh, different parts within BT, predominantly the, the business operational transformation team, where we've been looking at very new 
uh, efficient methods to detect changes in multivariate series, and particularly around anomaly detection for data streams. And I just wanted to give you some examples of the, the more recent research activity where we're looking to address those original challenges we highlighted and, and, and in particular how we can detect emergent phenomena. Um, and so the example on the slide here is showing daily throughput data from a, a regional BT hub. And as you can see, there's a typical pattern there, a regular structure, a uh, typical form. But, but when you start to zoom out from that and look at, say, daily throughput overlaid across a month, you can start to see where, um, for instance, in March, there's a clear what, what looks to be anomaly as a, as a red line. Um, you start to see some strange behavior, uh, perhaps for one day in April. And, and it perhaps comes as no surprise to you when you look towards December, that some of those days in December are slightly more unusual than others. So, so the challenge here is: can we start to detect these these changes or this the, these 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 things that look different as the data emerges, and and so really be able to detect that very very early on? And the answer is: well, yes, yes, we can. And um, Idris Eckley will be talking about how how we can do all of that in a very efficient way in his talk coming up in early January next year. And lastly, as we've touched on a number of these different areas around the project, as I've kind of given a tour, if you like, around some of the very different aspects, I think it's important to come back to the point that if we're going to be successfully operating this infrastructure in a normal, more autonomous way, we need to integrate it within the principal business functions of the company and we need to be able to trust it. And so any system needs to be driven by well-defined business processes and goals. It, it needs to warn us of problems and it needs to be able to be a vehicle for stimulating innovation and providing information and what if capabilities to explore new possibilities. So this will mean that we need to build trust between people and machines. How as a business can we garner trust in some of these systems that are increasingly relying on machine learning, for example, to make decisions? And Philip Stiles from Cambridge will talk more about this in his presentation next year. So I, I won't steal his thunder, but it's a really exciting part of the project, which looks at how we can take these technologies and successfully deploy them within the business, such as the people are confident that these systems behave in a way that they expect and, and, and can hence gain trust in their operation. So as I conclude the presentation, hopefully I've given you a bit of a guided tour around the different aspects of the project. And so to wrap up, I just want to highlight some of the up and coming talks that we've got in this series focused on NGCDI. And we start off in November with a talk by Ning Wang from Surrey and Harris Rotsos from Lancaster that's going to be focused on intent based networking. In December, we have a talk from Adjith from Cambridge that's going to be looking at asset management for service assurance, and that's scheduled for the 8th of December. In January, we have a talk from Idris from Lancaster, who's going to be focused on anomaly detection and how we can give that network assurance through detecting anomalies at massive scale. Then we have Philip Stiles from Cambridge's Judge Business School talking more about the, the new culture and governance for managing autonomous systems, and that's scheduled in February. And then finally, in our run of NGCDI presentations, we have Rob Pachocki from Bristol that's going to be talking more around the network resource optimizations and deep learning activities, particularly in relation to the work on Drive that I presented earlier. Uh, and so that's my counter through the NGCDI project. I, I hope I've given you enough to give you a, a sense of some of the key areas that we're working on. And uh, I should caveat this by saying that there's there's a lot of other activities within the project. And and unfortunately today I've only had an opportunity to highlight just a, some of those some of those areas. So um, many of those colleagues that are working on. Um, different aspects of the project. Hopefully we'll get a sense to see some of those work uh, that they're doing in the future as well. Um, but hopefully you can see there's a lot of activity that's going on here. So 
I'd encourage everyone to, to please do look at our website whilst we've got a, a little bit of time for questions, hopefully. Um, if there are other questions or if you're just interested in knowing more about the project, um, obviously we've got some more presentations coming up in this series, but, but please do feel free to contact me or Stephen about the project. We're excited to talk to you about the activities that are carrying on both now and that we've got planned uh, across the next few years. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.